It was a clear afternoon on March 7, 2023, just past 2 p.m., when two small aircraft converged in the skies over Winter Haven, Florida, unaware of each other until it was far too late. Within seconds, a routine day of flight training turned into a devastating mid-air collision that claimed four lives. The accident occurred in a narrow slice of busy Class G airspace shared by Winter Haven Regional Airport and Jack Brown's seaplane base, two facilities just 500 feet apart. Involved were a yellow float-equipped Piper J3C65 Cub and a white and red Piper PA28-161 Warrior, both on instructional flights, both following procedures, and yet neither saw the other coming. How could something like this happen in broad daylight with no clouds in sight? This is the story of a tragedy born not from a single mistake, but from a series of silent, invisible risks that still linger in our shared skies. Here's why. The Piper J3C was returning to Lake Jesse for a water landing after a local instructional flight, having departed the seaplane base at 1.05 p.m. Aboard were 78-year-old flight instructor Louis C. DeFazio, an airline transport pilot with 25,000 hours, seated in the front, and 67-year-old commercial pilot Randall Elbert Crawford, with 1,029 hours, receiving instruction in the rear seat. Concurrently, the Piper PA-28-161 Warrior, which had departed Lakeland Linder International Airport at 1.27 p.m., was practicing power-off 180-degree landing maneuvers to runway 29 at Winter Haven Regional Airport. This was the fourth such maneuver aimed at addressing the student pilot's prior unsatisfactory performance. The Warrior's crew consisted of 24-year-old flight instructor Faith Irene Baker, with 489 hours in the right seat, and 19-year-old student pilot Zachary Jean Mace, with 215 hours, in the left seat, both local residents of Winter Haven. The collision occurred at 465 feet above ground level, or 575 feet mean sea level, just east of runway 29's approach end. As the warrior executed a left turn to the base leg, the warrior's crew announced this turn over the common traffic advisory frequency, a standard procedure in the left-hand traffic pattern. Analysis of ADSB data from the Warrior and surveillance video from a nearby residence, as detailed in the NTSB's video study, revealed the J3C was traveling south to southwest at a ground speed of 46 knots with a descent rate of 456 feet per minute. The Warrior, moving at 80 knots with a steeper descent rate of 792 feet per minute, was in a descending left bank. The aircraft collided nearly head on with no evasive altitude or heading changes detected in the final five seconds. The warrior's right wing struck the J3C's right float, causing the wing to fracture at the root and a 50-inch inboard section to separate, with a 48-inch flap piece detaching. The J3C sustained severe damage, including a crushed lower corner of its right float and an 87-inch section of the chine and keelson torn away, exposing the float's interior. Both aircraft plummeted into Lake Hartridge, their wreckage scattered across the water. The Warrior's forward fuselage and remaining wing structures showed extensive impact damage, while the J3C's fuselage and empennage remained intact despite the float's compromise. All four occupants, two per aircraft, suffered fatal blunt force injuries, as confirmed by the district medical examiner. The substantial damage to both aircraft and the loss of life highlight the catastrophic consequences of converging flight paths in a shared airspace, setting the stage for an examination of the factors that allowed this tragedy to unfold. The NTSB's final report conclusively identifies the failure of both flight crews to see and avoid each other as the probable cause, with specific environmental and operational factors amplifying this breakdown. The incident occurred under optimal visual flight rules conditions, with winds from 300 degrees at 10 knots, 10-mile 10 visibility, and sparse clouds at 4,100 feet above ground level, aligning with runway 29 operations at Winter Haven Regional Airport. However, the NTSB determined that the complex visual environment, comprising a sun-bleached sky and the reflective waters of Lake Hartridge, severely hampered detection. Surveillance video confirmed that both the Piper J3C65 Cub, approaching from a southerly heading, and the Piper PA28161 Warrior, turning left to base, were positioned such that their respective crews should have seen each other, 
yet the intricate sky-ground backdrop obscured their view. This collision, occurring just east of Runway 29's approach end, underscores that clear weather, paradoxically, heightens mid-air collision risks near airports due to increased traffic and visual clutter. The absence of critical technology decisively contributed to the crew's inability to detect each other. The Piper PA-28161 was equipped with ADS-B out and a two-way radio, enabling its position to be broadcast on the common traffic advisory frequency and displayed on ADS-B-equipped aircraft. However, it lacked ADS-B in or any in-cockpit traffic display, rendering the crew blind to the non-transmitting J3C. The J3C, as confirmed by post-accident examination, had no radio, ADS-B in or out, or traffic display, equipment not mandated in Class G airspace. This left the J3C crew unaware of the Warriors' CTAF announcements and unable to signal their own position, eliminating any electronic cues that could have alerted either crew. The Warriors' emergency locator transmitter activated but was irrelevant for locating the wreckage, which was promptly found in Lake Hartridge. The NTSB concluded that the lack of traffic alerting systems on both aircraft forced reliance on visual scanning alone, a method proven inadequate in this high-density airspace. Operational demands and procedural shortcomings further sealed the collision's outcome. In the non-towered Class G environment, both crews were solely responsible for traffic separation under visual flight rules. The Warriors crew, executing their fourth power-off 180-degree landing maneuver, was likely consumed by cockpit tasks, monitoring instruments and aligning for a simulated forced landing, diverting their attention from external threats. The J-3C's crew, navigating a low-altitude approach over Lake Hartridge to Lake Jesse, focused on waterway identification, directing their gaze downward and rightward. The NTSB's analysis, supported by video evidence, indicates that the warrior appeared stationary on the J-3C's windscreen, and vice versa, due to their near head-on paths, a phenomenon that human vision struggles to detect without relative motion. The experienced J-3C instructor, with 25,000 hours, and student, with 1,029 hours, as well as the warrior's instructor, with 489 hours, and student, with 215 hours, were all vulnerable to this perceptual limitation. Additional human factors, while not definitive, compounded the risk. The warrior's instructor had ceterizing in her system at levels indicating possible sedation, a concern given the FAA's 48-hour wait recommendation for this antihistamine due to potential vigilance impairment, though the NTSB found no clear evidence that sedation directly caused the collision, it noted the potential for reduced alertness. Procedurally, the altitude separation strategy, airport traffic at 1,000 feet, mean sea level, roughly 850 feet above ground, versus seaplanes below 500 feet above ground, failed. The J-3C's practice of zeroing altimeters on the water, creating a 146-foot offset, likely placed it closer to the warrior's 465-foot descent path, as confirmed by ADSB and video data. The NTSB's findings pinpoint these layered failures, visual obstruction, technological deficits, task saturation, and procedural misalignment as the conclusive drivers of a tragedy that could have been averted with enhanced awareness or equipment. So, this tragic mid-air collision exposes critical vulnerabilities in general aviation operations, particularly in busy, non-towered airspace. The National Transportation Safety Board's probable cause, failure of both flight crews to see and avoid each other, underscores the need for systemic changes to prevent such accidents. A key recommendation is for Winter Haven Regional Airport and Jack Brown Seaplane Base to jointly review their coordination procedures. The long-standing practice at the seaplane base of setting altimeters to zero on the water, creating a 146-foot discrepancy with airport traffic, may no longer suffice in today's high-traffic environment. This discrepancy, combined with the expectation that seaplanes remain below 500 feet above ground while airport traffic flies at 1,000 feet, means sea level failed to prevent the collision at 465 feet above ground. A collaborative reassessment could establish standardized altitude references or designated transition corridors to enhance separation, ensuring that operational differences between land and water-based aircraft do not compromise safety. Technology adoption offers another avenue to bolster situational awareness. 
The NTSB report highlights the absence of ADSB in or in cockpit traffic displays on both aircraft, with the Piper J3C lacking even a radio or ADSB out. While not required in Class G airspace, equipping seaplanes at Jack Browns with portable ADSB in devices or basic traffic displays could provide instructors and students with real-time alerts about nearby aircraft, such as the Piper PA28161 broadcasting ADSB out. Similarly, mandating two-way radios for all operations in this congested airspace would enable critical communication on the common traffic advisory frequency, bridging the gap left by the J3C's silence. These upgrades, though costly, are feasible for operators like Jack Browns, which has safely trained pilots for decades but now faces increased traffic density. Encouraging such technologies aligns with the FAA's push for enhanced collision avoidance, as outlined in the Aeronautical Information Manual, and could serve as a model for other non-towered airports. Pilot awareness and training must also evolve to address the limitations of the see and avoid concept, which the NTSB notes is inherently flawed in high-density environments. The complex sky and ground backdrop, as seen over Lake Hartridge, can mask aircraft, especially when pilots are task-saturated. The FAA's Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge recommends structured scanning techniques using short, 10-degree eye movements with one-second pauses to detect threats. Operators should integrate these methods into training, emphasizing vigilance near airports where mid-air collisions are most prevalent. Additionally, educational programs should highlight the benefits and limitations of traffic displays, ensuring pilots understand how to interpret data without becoming overly reliant. Raising awareness of collision risks under visual flight rules, particularly in clear weather, can shift pilot mindsets from complacency to proactive scanning, reducing the likelihood of overlooking a converging aircraft. This accident serves as a sobering reminder that mid-air collisions stem from a cascade of missed opportunities, visual, communicative, and technological. The NTSB's safety alert on preventing mid-air collisions urges pilots to leverage available tools and maintain disciplined scanning, even in ideal conditions. By implementing coordinated procedures, embracing affordable technology, and fostering a culture of heightened awareness, the aviation community can honor the memory of Louis C. DeFazio, Randall Elbert Crawford, Faith Irene Baker, and Zachary Jean Mace. Their loss compels us to act, ensuring that no pilot, student, or instructor faces the same fate in a preventable tragedy. As a final note, let's keep our eyes outside the cockpit and our radios on, because in shared skies, seeing and being heard can make all the difference.